Uh, thank you for coming to the session. Uh, I would like to introduce Rob Vesse. Vesse, yeah. Vesse, <laughs> uh, who's a software engineer at Yark Data, and we all know what Yark means. Uh, <laughs> uh, working on the Eureka Graph Analytics platform. He's a resident uh, RDF Sparkle and Semantic Web Expert, having been heavily involved in these areas for the past five years. Currently, he's a committer and PMC member of the Apache Jena project, and uh, also the lead developer of the .NET RDF project, which are the de facto standards of uh, semantic technology APIs on the Java and .NET stat stacks, respectively. He's, uh, he also contributes on the mailing lists of various other Apache projects and in big data and semantic technology spaces. Rob's previously uh, spoken several times at the same tech <laughs> conference series and presented academic work at the ICWC. What's that? Uh, Iswick. Iswick. <laughs> and yeah. World Wide Web conferences. He has also given talks at several developer-focused semantic technology <laughs> meetups. Uh, when he's not coding. <laughs> You're really going to read every last word now. <laughs> I'm very interested. What do you think he does when he's not coding? <laughs> he, he skates and uh, he's cool. he coach. <laughs> so, uh, Thanks. Okay, well, uh, let's jump right in then. I mean, <laughs> so I think the positive you kind of just covered everything, <laughs> most of the stuff on this slide. So, yeah. So, I joined the Jenna project January 2012, so when it was actually in the incubator. So, Jenna's been around since 2001. It's a old project. Um, and when HP kind of sort of stopped funding it, you know, the guys behind it, because you know, it was already open source, so they decided to take the code with them and find a new home, and they ended up at Apache. Oop, sorry, didn't mean to jump for. Um, so, so other than Jenner, I also hang out on a bunch of other Apache mailing lists, so Incubator, Gira I'm interested in sort of graphs, RDF or otherwise, so I've, I've done a bit of stuff with Giraffe, I've got some patches in there, I played a lot with Hadoop and things, so. But generally, I'm a RDF Sparkle nut. <laughs> so, uh, Mobada is a uh, linked data platform. So, it's kind of a web based, you know, RESTful, uh, sort of RESTful platform for, you know, storing and serving up your RDF data. Okay, now it doesn't want to go forward. <laughs> Okay, so sort of what I kind of want to talk about today, um, a few quick definitions, although I think you, <laughs> from talking beforehand, we can probably skip over those fairly quickly. Um, then sort of why JDBC for Sparkle, because I think that's kind of an important question to address. Um, and then I actually want to talk about Jenna JDBC, which is a particular implement this implementation we've done as part of the Jenna project, and talk about sort of what this thing actually looks like, and also some of the issues associated with using it. So, uh, it's going, it's automatically advancing slides for me, isn't it? <laughs> so I should not have done the rehearse timings thing. <laughs> um, and then I'll do a quick little uh, bit of example code and demo. And then I also want to talk about alternative options, because you know, this isn't the only way of doing Sparkle over JDBC or JDBC for Sparkle. There are other approaches that are also open source. So, you know, if this is something you think might work for your project, this our particular way of doing it might not necessarily be the solution for you. So, so definitions, I think we're probably okay with, right? I mean, you know RDF, you know pretty much what Sparkle is, and I assume you also know JDBC reasonably well. So, we'll kind of skip over that. So. You know, the obvious question, why JDBC for Sparkle? So, you know, I, I work at a company, we sell an RDF and Sparkle store, and we're selling a lot into sort of traditional enterprise customers. They've got big data warehouses. They've got, you know, they've got a lot of legacy data in existing systems, and they've also got a lot of investment in existing analytics tools. They've got things like Pentaho, Tableau, ClickView, you know, they're paying for lots of licenses for these pieces of software and you're trying to sell them this product, and you're like, and they go, well, can I use it with X and Y? You know, 
uh, no. Well, what do I use instead? And you go, well, there's these open source things. You know, there's no real, you know, there's not the commercial grade kind of user interfaces for this technology yet. It's still relatively young. Um, and if you look at kind of, you know, the actual analytics tools, you know, they're typically geared around relational databases. A lot of them now have Hadoop support or Hive support, you know. But, you know, they typically, they only support the things, you know, what's the biggest, what's on the bandwagon right now? What's the biggest, most popular thing? So where they do support relational databases, you know, JDBC is typically the API of choice. And if it's not JDBC, you know, it's ODBC, and we can easily do ODBC to JDBC bridges, and it's a heck of a lot easier to write Java code and write a JDBC driver than it is to write a full-blown ODBC driver. You know, and what we're trying to do by producing this is, you know, avoid the problem of we don't want to have to integrate Sparkle natively into every single tool on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, it, it's time-consuming. You know, as soon as you go to the next user, they go, oh, but what about my favorite tool? And also, you know, you run into issues about you can't easily reuse code between different tools because proprietary plugin APIs or there's, you know, there's maybe semi-proprietary, semi you know, the code you write for one doesn't easily port to another. And you end up wasting a lot of effort just, you know, reinventing the wheel every time. Whereas by implementing a JDBC driver, we can use Sparkle in any tool that talks JDBC. Um, there's some ifs and buts there, which I'll talk as we go through, but, you know, in, in principle, it, you know, it should just work. So let's kind of talk about Jenna JDBC itself. So Jenna JDBC is a set of modules part of the Apache Jenna project. Um, they were first released about a year ago. Um, they were in a, they've been in our two dot, well, I think they became sort of an experimental module about a year ago and they were in an official release about six months ago. So sort of late autumn, which is the 2.11.0 release. Um, they're not included in our convenience binary packages. So um, that's just because Jenner is actually quite a big project. We've got about half a million lines of code spread over sort of about 10 or so different modules. So our binary artifacts kind of ship the core system that most of our users traditionally want, and then the extra bits they get themselves from Maven or from building from source. So. Um, so these things are in Maven. They, you know, um, org.apache Jenna is our standard group ID, and then all the artifacts for this are Jenna-JDUC-foo, and then foo's are the specific sub-module in the project. Um, and these are versioned differently from the main project, so current version's 1.0.1. And there's a whole bunch of documentation on the website. Um, if you actually jump to the website, you just there's a learn menu at the top, the drop down, and JDBC for Sparkle is one of the one of the main topics there. So, what exactly is it? So, the idea was not just to build a JDBC driver for Sparkle, but to build a framework for JDBC drivers for Sparkle. So, we wanted to make it possible to do, you know query our existing stores, but also make it extensible so you could plug in your own backend as and when you want it to. So um, there's an important point to be made there. So it's JDBC 4.0 API compatible, but not compliant. Um, so there's an interesting distinction in the JDBC spec that, you know, you can obviously write a driver that implements all the APIs, and so it's API compatible, but being JDBC compliant requires certain things like you're supposed to support SQL 92. And um, we're doing Sparkle, so obviously we don't support SQL 92. Um, so then, you know, using the framework, we then provide actual drivers for the main backends that the Jenna project supports. So we have a very crude in-memory store. Um, then we have TDB, which is our, our native persistent disk based store. And we support talking to remote endpoints, which basically means out of the box, you can pretty much talk to any, any store that complies with the Sparkle standards. And then essentially, you know, it provides you Sparkle over JDBC. So 
you use the JDBC API as usual, but instead of executing SQL queries, you execute Sparkle queries. And also, you know, to be helpful to end users, we have a, an Uber jar artifact that's basically, you know, a single jar bundle, you know, bundles all the drivers, all the dependencies into one thing. So, because a lot of JDC tools expect you to just drop in a single jar and point it at them. So, so crude architecture diagram time. Um, so it's a very basic layered architecture. So there's the core API at the bottom. Um, I'll talk more about what that entails in a minute. Then there's you know the driver implementations, and then there's the bundle that wraps them all up in a single thing. So the core API is basically aiming to provide that framework that lets you build the drivers. So it's abstract implementations of kind of all the infrastructure you need. So you've got you know a fairly complete implementation of connections, of statements, of result sets, et cetera. You've got all the machinery around turning Sparkle results into JDBC results style APIs. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the issues around that in a minute. Um, and the whole idea was to be extensible and reusable. So you can build new drivers for new backends on top of it. And the core API probably most users won't need to know about because it's all just implementations of the standard JDBC API. So from most users' perspective, they're only ever going to see the normal JDBC API. You know, the actual instance types are obviously from this API, but the user probably. One question about the package. Yeah. Yeah. So is this API designed to essentially backend agnostic? Yeah, it is backend agnostic. Okay, so yeah, so let's sort of talk about the backends, because there are some differences between them. So like I said, one for each of our kind of major backend, so to speak. So so the in memory is it's completely non persistent, it's just Java objects. Um, you can initialize it from a file on disk, but it's specifically designed to be non persistent. So you know, it's useful for testing and prototyping. We lose, use it a lot in the, our unit testing, but it's not, you know, it's not something you would ever put out in production. Um, then TDB is the Jenna's native RDF database. Um, it's persistent, it's on disk. It supports transactions. It's uh, actually uh, serializable transactions, so it's full write-ahead logging, crash recovery, et cetera, so, you know, so we so you can actually use the JDC transaction API and underneath it's calling our low level transaction API for that. And then you've got remote endpoints. So like I said, you know, as part of the Sparkle standard, there is a HTTP protocol for talking to, you know, remote systems. So any system that supports that, we can talk to. Um, there are some there's a bit of there's some limitations to that because, you know. There's nothing in the standard that defines how to do transactions over HTTP. So even if your remote store supports transactions and exposes some API for it, our, our API, you know, the basic implementation doesn't know about that, so won't support transactions. And then, like I said, there's a bundle that pulls these all together into a single Maven artifact. So connection strings, connection strings look fairly similar to sort of traditional JDBC connection to strings. Um, everything has this standard Jenna prefix, and then we have so it's sort of JDBC colon Jenna colon foo, where foo is a specific driver you're using. And different drivers have different, um, different arguments. So we've got a couple of examples of using the in-memory driver at the top. We've got the first one where it's bringing in some data, initial data set from a file. Got another one where it's saying I just want to start with an empty data set. Um, for TDB, because it's a persistent disk database, you know, we're providing the location on disk where the data is stored, where it's going to read in the data from. And then for remote endpoints, we're providing where's the query endpoint and where's the update endpoint. Um, so there's an interesting thing here is, you know, the remote driver lets you do, you can do read-only connections, write-only connections, or they write only connections, a little strange, or you can do read write connections depending on the store you're talking to and whether you want to, you know, so you can open the connection such that you can't accidentally update it and things like that. So, um, and then each each of the drivers has various some implementation specific parameters. 
Um, the documentation kind of lists these all out in full. Um, one interesting one I'm going to mention now that I'm going to come back to in a couple of slides is um, JDBC compatibility, this parameter. And this is kind of to do with an issue I'll talk about in a minute about how we control data typing. Because you know, one of the big problems we have is how to bridge the data model gap. So RDF and Sparkle are talking about graphs, whereas JDBC is talking about relational databases. So JDBC is assuming this model of the world where everything's a table, has columns, you know, you have rows, et cetera, whereas Sparkle, it's a graph, and not only is it a graph, but you've got four different query forms bringing you back four slightly different types of results. So select is a nice, easy one. Select is actually very similar to SQL, and it's giving you back tabular results, so there's no translation there need, you know, needed. Um, ask, again, is relatively simple. It's, you know, ask is basically saying, are there any solutions that satisfy my query, but I don't care what the solutions are. You're just going to get a true or false. So, you know, that's just a single row, single column, single row. And then you get construct and describe. So these are taking the graph and trans and either picking out a subgraph of it or creating a new subgraph from the existing data. So for that, we just kind of flatten the triples into a tabular form. So, you know, we just have a subject predicate, an object column, flatten it out, nice and simple. So then we get into this issue of actual column typing. So we end up engaging in a whole lot of duck typing. So you know, one, of, one of the problems with JDBC being a relational API is it assumes a view of the world where all columns are uniformly typed. So you've got your table, you've got your name column, it's going to be a string. You've got your age column, it's going to be an integer. And it assumes every row, every row you get in that is going to conform to that restriction. And in Sparkle, it's just not true. It's very easy, you know, there's no requirement for the data to be homogenous in any way. Nor, and it's quite easy to write queries that can produce you, you know, completely mismatched data types in the same column. So we had a kind of a bit of a discussion about, you know, well, how do we handle this? You know, what's the best way? And the answer we kind of came to was, well, it's not one size fits all. So this is where this JDBC compatibility parameter comes in, this idea of making how we do our data typing configurable. So we, at the sort of the top level, is we have what we call our high compatibility. So this is where we engage in duck typing. So we look at the results you're getting back, and we inspect the rows and say, well, this column looks like it's a string. It looks like it's a date. And we assume everything in that column is going to be a date or an integer or a Boolean. And you know, when you actually come to try and get out a date or a Boolean, it may or may not work, because it might not actually be that. But you know, if you're trying to play as nice as possible with tools that are doing, you know, going to do nice formatting on the results you get, then that's kind of the behavior you want. But then equally, you find tools where they just don't like, they don't like when the data isn't uniform. So you can kind of go to the other extreme, what we call the low compatibility, where you say, everything's going to be an object. So you type all the columns as objects, and then most of the tools end up just throwing up their hands and going, well, I don't know how to render that. You know, you've got an object. So, you know, if you know that you're using Sparkle over JDBC, you're not trying to just shoehorn it into some other tool that doesn't really understand Sparkle, and you know you want to, you can retrieve it as a RDF term behind the scenes and stuff, you know, then maybe that's the option for you. So, but what we do as our default behavior is what we call our medium compatibility is we just say everything's a string. So it's a horrible compromise, but in practice it actually proves to work very well because, you know, all the tools know how to display a string, and everything in RDF can be, you know, turned into a string for display, and it's not necessarily very pretty, but it works. And then we have a problem with metadata. We have to do a lot of fudging with the metadata. So again, JDBC being very relational centric in its outlook, by definition, <laughs> you know, it asks you all these questions about what are your tables, what are your, you know, do you support this type of SQL clause? Do you support that type of SQL clause? Can you do subqueries? Which variants of SQL do you support? What are your, you know, 
What are your extension functions? What are your user-defined data types? And some of those things have some level of equivalent in Sparkle and RDF that you can kind of report. And some of them, just, there's just no comparison. So we end up with this kind of sort of slightly weird picture of metadata. So we, you know, we support basic driver information, information. So we can tell you the version of the driver, the name, you know, things like the name of the database and stuff like that. We can tell you function and keyword information because obviously we know what the Sparkle keywords are and we know what the Sparkle functions are. And we can tell you about SQL language support. Mostly we tell you we don't support it, obviously. Although where there's kind of, where things are kind of ambiguous where it says, well, do you support subqueries? I'm like, well, Sparkle does have subqueries and we support them, so we say yes. You know, and that does create some issues because some tools then interpret that as, oh, you support SQL now, even if you said, Oh, I don't actually support SQL. Um, and then there's some obvious things that we don't support because there's just no equivalent. So there is no such thing as a table, it's just a graph. So we don't have any table information. And there's no user-defined procedures equivalent in Sparkle right now. Um, there, are, there are a few vendor-specific extensions, but there's nothing, there's nothing standardized, so we have nothing to report. You know, and again, there's no schema information because it's just a graph. There may, be, there may be triples that encode some sort of schema in there, but we don't try and expose that in any way right now. Um, and when I come towards the end of the talk, talk about alternatives, there are some other approaches to doing Sparkle over JDBC that kind of do this in a different way that lets you, gets you a different set of metadata that's maybe better in some, depending on your application. So despite doing all this, we still run into this thing of you're trying, to sh you're trying to stick a square peg in the round hole, ultimately. You're trying to make this API that has a very rigid worldview conform to this other thing that's completely different. And so we found some tools, you know, even after we'd done all this work, we'd done all this data typing, configurability, you know, we try and, you know, we try and use it with a particular tool, and the tool would do something we completely unexpected. So we have one tool where it turns out whatever query you actually type in, it wraps in its own subquery. Because the way this turns out what the tool is doing internally is it's converting the data it gets out of your database into its own internal database, which it then uses for its visualizations. So it's trying to wrap your query in its own pair, you know, outer query and rewrite your column names and things. And of course, that's a SQL query because it's assuming you're a SQL system. And so we had to kind of introduce this pre and post processing API into our framework to sort of allow you to say, you know, well, sometimes you're going to find a tool that just isn't going to play nice. It's not going to do the right thing. So you can add both pre and post request processes to any connection in, in the API. And you can have multiples of those. You can stack them up in a queue kind of thing. And so preprocess get either the raw, you can either have the raw Sparkle or SQL string, depending on what, where it's coming from, or you can have the sort of the Sparkle query or up, update AST, like after it's gone through our Sparkle parser, but before we actually try and execute it, so you can modify it at that level if that's easier. Um, so like the case I was just talking about, we used it to kind of strip out this outer query that this particular tool was putting on. Um, and also to look at that and figure out what it wanted us to do in terms of column renaming. Um, and then post processes kind of work at the other end of the pipeline. You know, so once we run the query on the back end, we get the results back. As we're mar trying to marshal those into the JDBC results API, we give you the post processes the opportunity to change the results. So to do things like remap the column names. Um, or another, another example of a, a tool we ran into an issue with, we, we found, so RDF uses XML schema for its data types. And most of the integer data types in XML schema are actually equivalent to like long integers. So they're, you know, so of course when we do our duck typing approach, oops, sorry. When we're doing our duck typing approach, it's, you know, we're typing things as a long because that's potentially what the data is. And we found one particular tool that only likes integers. It doesn't like longs. And so, you know, so you get into this thing of, well, do I, you know, 
I can make this compromise. Well, I can stick in a post processor that will say any column that's a long, pretend it's actually an integer. And then that probably breaks on some of your data. But if it makes the tool at least work part of the time, you know, maybe that's better than nothing. So let's have a quick look at some example code. So if you've done anything with JDBC, the code should look pretty familiar. It's, you know, it's not much different from any normal JDBC code you'd write. The only real difference is you're using one of our connection strings to start with, you know, to get a connection to a Sparkle store. And then instead of writing a SQL query, you're writing a Sparkle query. But you can still do all the things you normally do, so we fully support prepared statements. God damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so in this example here, we're, you know, preparing a statement, and then we're injecting a parameter for the name of the graph we want to actually query. You know, and we can do, you know, and you can inject any, you know, pretty much all the primitive data types and we'll handle the mapping those into their equivalent RDF representations. So, you know, we'll turn them into the XML schema forms, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it is slightly tricky because obviously in Sparkle, as you can see, you know, it's also the start of variable names. So, um, essentially, if you want to use the JDBC style of just putting a single question mark for a parameter, you can do providing it has to be followed by either white space or certain, punc certain punctuation that's not allowed in a variable name. That's kind of how we distinguish it. Um, the other thing we can do is you can, you can do name parameters. So in principle, I can, set, I can set any of these variables as well. So I could say set s to a constant as well. I don't... I'm not restricted to only using the JDBC style parameters. I can also do name param, you know, I can do name parameters as well as index-based parameters. You know, and other than you know, other than those couple of details, you know, it's essentially the same as any JDBC code you'd write normally. You know, you get your statement, you prepare it, you set any parameters, you execute it, you do whatever you want with your results, you clean up as usual. You know, code-wise, it's you know exactly the same. Okay, so which way am I going? So I want to go ahead and try and do a, a quick live demo. So see if the demo gods get me or not. Um, <laughs> so this is um, Squirrel SQL. I mean, you know, open source SQL client on SourceForge supports a whole ton of databases. And it easily lets you drop in your own drivers. So here I've got all three of my, the Jenna JDBC drivers registered in. So, so if I just open up the configuration for this driver for a second, you can see, you know, Literally, all I've had to do is point it, you know, point it at my jar file, which I've got on my disk. Um, in Squirrel SQL, I can give it a kind of an example connection URL that will use for new connections, so help people write them, you know. And I've just had to give my, you know, give the name of the, you know, the actual class name of the driver. Um, so that is one. There's one bug we have in the current stable release is we're not yet using the service provider, the service loader mechanism of the JDK. So um, that's actually been fixed in trunk. So this is a trunk build. So you know, it actually, auth you know, it's got the relevant metadata. So if I hit this button, it'll actually show me all the available drivers in the bundle. Whereas if you're using the current release version, you'll have to manually type in the class name. So. We have fixed that. <laughs> so then I have some actual connections set up. So if I so so this is an actual connection to a, a data set I have on my machine. So uh, it's a data set called Lovem Zero. So it's a standard Sparkle benchmark data set. Lehigh University. Yeah, Lehigh University one. Yeah. So um, I do a lot of benchmarking stuff. So 
I have a few of these lying around, so they're just, and they're nice kind of demo data sets because they're, you know. So, you know, I've got a nice simple connection string, you know, I've got my prefix and I'm just saying location and my path to my data set on disk. And I didn't really mention authentication earlier, but, you know, we support the standard username and password variables for authentication, so um, TDB doesn't have any security, so it doesn't matter if I put a pass username or password in, it won't have any effect. But if you're talking to a remote endpoint over HTTP, you know, there may be HTTP authentication to be done. So, you know, we do fully support various kind of all manner of authentication schemes if you want to do that. So, if I go ahead and actually connect. So, I get, you know, I have a few queries I prepared earlier, so I can just go ahead and run, you know, I've got my Sparkle query, so Squirrel is kind of flagging it as having syntax errors because obviously it doesn't understand Sparkle, but, you know, I can run it and I get, you know, I get a table of results back. I've got, you know, it's maybe not particularly interesting results, but, you know, I can sort on the columns, I can do, you know, all the things I'd be expected to be able to do in a JDBC tool. So, so the next example I want to look at is this one. So I talked before about the, the data typing behavior. So I'm sorry the text is a bit small, but this is literally as big as I can get Squirrel SQL to make the text. It's capped at 14 points. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So Sparkle actually has this values construct that lets you kind of insert inline data. And it's useful for doing demos and things like this because you can kind of insert some mock test data that's not actually in the database. So I've got a bunch of columns design, define string, int, bool, double, and I've got a value in each of those, you know, that are appropriately formatted for those data types. So I go ahead and run this and I get, you know, I get something sane looking back and it actually, you know, it's formatting things kind of appropriately but if I actually look at the metadata here, if I scroll across, so, so it's actually, I'm actually in, you know, I'm running in the default settings, so actually it's just typing everything as a string for me. So because things kind of look right anyway, it is actually, you know, they present quite nicely in the UI, but actually behind the scenes, the API is reporting everything's a string. And that's not necessarily, as I said, that's not necessarily what we want. So if I actually disconnect from the connection a minute. And then I go ahead and actually can modify my alias. So I'm going to set my JDBC compatibility to nine. So we use a one to nine scale, one being low, nine being high, nice and easy to remember. So I set it to high, and I go ahead and connect again. So, say, you know, same data set as before. So I bring in the same query as before and run it. And you can see now, Squirrel SQL's formatted my data slightly differently. So my double's now been actually expanded out, you know, from its exponent form into the actual value it represents. And if I actually go and look at my metadata now, I can see the columns are now being appropriately duct typed. So, you know, it's figured out this first column string, it looks like a string, the next one looks like an integer, so on and so forth. But of course, this isn't, this isn't perfect. So, I have a slightly modified version of the above query. So, this time I've got a second row but in my integer column, I've got, a, I've got a string instead of an integer. So we go ahead and run this one. You know, my first row comes back, you know, I got the integer properly. In my second row, it completely mangled it. It didn't understand how to do, you know, what to do with it. And behind the scenes, we do try and coerce between types wherever possible. Because obviously the, the RDF data typing model based on XML schema doesn't map that directly to, you know, 
the type systems in things like Java or, in, or a lot of other popular languages. So there's a certain amount of kind of, you know, coercing that has to go on anyway. So we do our best to kind of coerce things appropriately, but it doesn't always, it's not always perfect. Um, and equally, I can go, I can go the other way. So if I go ahead and modify my alias again and turn the compatibility right down to low, connect again, and now I run the same query, I get this ooh, unknown type. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't understand because I've just typed everything as an object and it doesn't recognize the actual underlying type because you know, the underlying type is now the gen and node class which represents an RDF term. And Squirrel SQL has no clue what to do with that thing. So, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, tweaking that parameter kind of makes the tools behave quite differently with the software. Well, it's, I mean, in principle, we could do both. I mean, we, we, although here I'm setting it at connection time, it is just a, at the API, it is just a, you know, it's a getter and setter. So you could change it at runtime. We don't, right now, we don't specifically associate it with a query. I mean, that wouldn't be that hard to do, to be honest. It would be probably quite a useful enhancement to be able to decide on a per query basis, oh, this one, I want high, you know, I want the duck typing. This one, I just want everything as strings. This one, I don't, you know, I, I know it's RDF. I want the actual RDF directly, you know. So. Yeah. I was thinking about that because the, the query is where the, the, the business logic is, right? So yeah. in some cases, you know the query is going to be returning a line of information. Yeah. In some cases, you know it won't, right? If you do a general SQL pattern match. Yeah, you know it's going to be, yeah a lot of different data types, whereas, yeah, if you've had a very specific query, like, oh, select everyone's ages, you probably know it's all gonna be integers, yeah, that kind of thing, so, yeah, that's, that's a good idea for a future enhancement. <laughs> I'll be filing, filing a Jira afterwards. <laughs> and are you still in edit? Uh, do you mind if I just go back to Google while we're going here, or do you want Yeah, sure, no, it's fine, I've not got much more to talk about, so. Um, well, we, no, we support quads, but you can't, this thing, you can't necessarily directly get back a quad. So you've got the construct and describe forms, which gives you an RDF graph, so they're always triples. And you can, and obviously you can use the graph clause in Sparkle to find out what graph something came from, but you can't get Sparkle to give you quads directly as output. You can get tabular results that are essentially quads. So you can do that, but you can't, there isn't a, a query form in Sparkle that gives you quads directly. So with support for the multi-graph queries that are possible in the quad paradigm, right, where you can do like Sparkle yeah. one-to-one -one or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. And then similar to that, um, what about some of the more complex type of Sparkle queries, things like the property path? Yeah, I mean, we, anything that, Jenna supports in its Sparkle implementation, we support. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, assuming that whatever the actual back end is then supports that feature, because obviously there may be there may be some back ends that don't support specific language features. So so like my company, um, our product, we don't support the federated query extension. Because typically our box is going into someone's private data center. It's internal, entirely internal on their network and it can't see the internet, so federated query makes zero sense for us. So, you know, in that kind of, God's sake. <laughs> it really does have a mind of its own, doesn't it? So it, in that sense, yeah, it, you know, at the driver level, it supports, in principle, any valid Sparkle. Um, and in theory, you can do things to actually extend what Sparkle it would support. It's, Extending the actual Sparkle parser is not an easy process. We also do that at my company, and it's a bit of a rat's nest of stuff because it's 
there's Java CC involved, and um, there's certain assumptions in the API that the things don't change that much. And but yeah, in principle, anything that anything that looks like valid Sparkle will pass down to whatever the underlying storage is, and then whether you get an error or you get success is going to depend a bit on whether the underlying store actually supports every aspect of that query. Do you have any other, any other questions right now? Or? So kind of the final thing I wanted to talk about is alternatives. So what we've done in the Jenna project is not the only option out there. So um, there's a couple of very similar approaches to ours, um, both on Google Code. Um, one, by, one by a guy called William Greenlee called JDBC for Sparkle. Another one by a guy called Paul Giron called SCON. Um, they're both very similar to our approach. They only support remote endpoints, I believe. Um, and they don't, they're not as clever about some of the things, like the whole data typing thing. They're a bit more basic with that. I think they I think both of those just type everything as strings, you know, just because it's it's easy to do. Um, and both of those are kind of dormant as well. But uh, another really interesting approach, um, a guy called Claude Warren, who's actually on the Jenna PMC now. So he he wrote this before before he joined the PMC and before. Um, and there is some talk that we might eventually merge his approach with the one in the main project currently. But um, his approach is rather than just doing Sparkle through JDBC is to map RDF into a kind of relational model. So you define a mapping of, well, these are my kind of virtual tables essentially, and the, you know these correspond to these patterns in the graph, and then you know it takes the SQL query and compiles it into the equivalent Sparkle query, you know, and so if you're, you know, and that so obviously that can play a lot nicer with traditional JDBC tools, because to them it looks much more like a relational database. You know, and it's not, an, again, you know, it's, it's pros and cons, you're weighing up, you know, which way you want to go, how do you want to be writing, you know, if you're doing RDF, ideally you want to be writing Sparkle, because it makes much more sense, but maybe, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, being able to write SQL against it may be a lot easier. Um, and like I said, eventually that may get merged into the main general project and then we'll have the ability to do both and potentially switch between them, et cetera, so. Um, so there's just any other questions? Yeah. So, um, limitations, so um, like I mentioned, it doesn't, we don't, the current version doesn't use the service loader mechanism, so Certain tools can't automatically find the drivers. Um, another interesting one, if you're you know used to JDBC, is oh, for, <laughs> you can't. Um, so in, in JDBC, you get your result set, and a lot of times you can modify your data directly on the result set. So as you're iterating through your result set, you can say, I want to delete this row, or I want to change the value in this column, that kind of thing. And we don't support that at all, mainly because it's, it's just hard to do in the Sparkle model because you've got to know, well, how do I map the results I got back into the triples I've got to add or remove in the underlying data, underlying RDF store? And you know, that's not a trivial problem. So we just we just punted on it and said, well, you, we give you Sparkle updates, so you can you know you can use the standard JDBC, JDBC API and you know. You can prepare a statement, then call execute update, you know, to run your updates and do updates that way. But you can't, as you're iterating over your query results, change the data directly by just doing the set calls or the delete row calls, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, yeah, those, I mean, those are really the two major limitations. Obviously, the metadata, you know, the fact that we don't support certain metadata is obviously a limitation, but that's kind of there's not much we can do about that unless you kind of like to go down this alternative approach of trying to map it back up into a relational model, which has its own problems. So, you know, 
Yeah, the sort of uh, property tables approach yeah, kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you, either, you can kind of do it semi-automatically by kind of you know, querying the data to get the metadata you need to do that mapping automatically, or you can have mappings you define in advance yourself, you know, and that's maybe more useful depending, you know, if you know you want to make the data look a certain way, maybe you want to do manual mappings, but if you want to, you know, if you just want something quick and dirty, maybe you want to automate everything, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not something you want to do dynamically all the time. I mean, to do it one off every so often is probably acceptable, but yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Oh, what the, the, 